Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Okay. Praise God. Well, I must say I enjoy this wonderful time here in, uh, at uh, the conference. Um, you are here. Jesus is here. I'm also here. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. May the Lord help us to gear up for the greatest harvest of souls this world has ever seen. This world has ever, 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 ever seen. Um, I would like to share with you this morning from my heart. And uh, I believe the Holy Spirit will touch our spirits. You know, when I arrived in Africa, as I already said, I started below zero. And I'm sure anyone can start there. Some always want to start on the top, but in God's wisdom, trees grow from the bottom to the top. And that's where we all start, and we should never despise small beginnings. It is a matter of, of the Holy Spirit rearing us, bringing us up. There will be trials, there will be quarrels, there will be all sorts of unpleasant matters, but if you keep the divine call in front of your eyes and pursue it with all purpose, you will see the hand of God will lift you up. Hallelujah. Um, I had some fantastic, what shall I say, some, some very fantastic experiences right from my youth that kind of uh, uh, shoehorned me into this position when I, I attended by the bible college in britain um, after i had finished my studies let me start off like this here this morning um, i think it is a very good introduction I returned to Germany. I lived in uh, North Germany where my parents uh, were. And um, just north of Hamburg. I always say it's quite funny, you know, I grew up in Hamburg and later on I lived in Frankfurt, but I'm neither a Hamburger nor a Frankfurter. <laughs> <laughs> So when I returned, I just completed my studies and I returned to Germany. In those days, we didn't go by plane, we went by train. And I had a whole day to, to, of, of time to kill in London. And I wanted to do some sightseeing. My train left at around midnight and uh, I had the whole day at my disposal. So I wanted to do some sightseeing but because... I had just a couple of coins in my pocket. I couldn't, I, I couldn't go with an organized tour. I just uh, went from bus to bus, what they call bus hopping. One bus went in that direction. I didn't even know where it was going to. I just went along and then I changed at the bus station, took another bus and another bus and another bus. And I was kind of crisscrossing London. The whole time. And then all of a sudden I, I thought by myself, I need to stretch my legs. I need to move a little bit. I got off the bus and just walked into a residential area for the sake of exercise. All of a sudden, to my surprise, as I passed the house, I saw a nameplate reading George Jeffries. And I thought, wow, I know of a man called George Jeffries. 
he was he was a man who brought the gospel of signs and wonders to the United Kingdom I read his book can it be that this man lives here I thought by myself no I was just nine I was just 21 years of age at that time so my mind said, no, this is London, Jeffreys is a common name, there must be thousands. And George is a very common name, there must be tens of thousands. So this is just a coincidence. But then a still small voice told me inside and said, you've got so much time to kill, why don't you find out? So I walked through the front garden, I pushed the button of the bell. And a lady appeared. I said, excuse me, ma'am, is this the George Jeffries living in this house whom God used so mightily to bring the gospel of signs and wonders to Britain? And she said to me, yes. I thought, what? I said, may I please see him? She said, no. And I tell you, that lady filled the door frame. She was like a roadblock. And when she repeated her no, I heard a deep voice from the inside saying, Let him come in. I don't know how I passed her, but I did. And in I was, and I saw George Jeffries walking down the stairs. I was awed. I didn't even know that that man was still alive. I said, I'm Reinhard Bonnke. I just finished Bible college. I've got a call to preach the gospel in Africa. And I, I, just, I just stumbled over your house. And while I was talking, trying to explain the situation, George Jeffries fell on his knees, pulling me down on the carpet. And he started to pray and bless me and bless me and bless me and bless me and bless me. And the glory of the Lord filled that place. After 30 minutes about, I got up again. I was dazed. I staggered out of the house trying to find the bus stop. And I said to myself, how is it possible that I stumbled on this house? How is it possible? I didn't even know that man was still alive. He wasn't on my mind at all. How is it possible? Today I know that my bus driver must have been the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I caught the train in the night back home. In Hamburg, my, my dad picked me up at the station. After greeting, he said to me, Reinhardt, I just heard the news that George Jeffries has died. I said, what? This can't be. I saw him yesterday. But it was the truth. And then I realized, I think I caught a mantle. I think I caught a mantle. And that's how God does it. I need to explain here something. I don't think I got his anointing because I don't want my fullness from the fullness of any man. Out of his fullness, we have all received. Only if we get our fullness from his fullness is would our fullness be the original fullness and not some copied stuff. No, 
I didn't get my anointing from him because I was already baptized into the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what I believe happened. I believe a connection took place there. I believe we are all connected, interconnected. God's anointed are interconnected from generation to generation to generation to generation. And God connected me there with the former generation of evangelists for this generation and i feel in my heart this is why i tell you the story here i believe with all of my heart that connect us are going to be connected right here today these things do happen and it goes back right back to the apostle paul it goes right back to jesus himself May the Lord grant this. That we are not just hearers and enjoyers of the word of God. But that we get going. Go! What frustrates me, I, I want to be very honest with you. I'm not really going to conferences much. I'm not a revivalist. I'm not called to shake up sleeping Christians once a year. That I don't want, I don't like it. Next year they are sleeping again. And next year they are sleeping again. Oh, I tell you may a fire start burning in your souls. And that will lift you out of your seats. Let me tell you even something worse than this. Jesus will lift you from the deepest pit, but he will not lift you out of your easy chair. He will not. He will not put a propeller behind you and shoot you off. You've got to do this, this something, this something. Here am I, Lord. Send me. He lifts you out of the pit, but you've got to get up from your easy chair. That's the principle of going. Go, go. In Jesus' name, say amen. amen. Oh, hallelujah. When I arrived in Lesotho, I told you already, people weren't interested in my preaching. I had to unlearn what I had learned before. And the Holy Spirit began to teach me completely fresh and new. It was the hard way, but it was a blessed way. All of a sudden, I realized the way I was coined and I had been taught was the way God couldn't use me. So by his grace, he reeled it all back and pushed record and started afresh. Hallelujah. I started a Bible correspondence course in Lesotho. And to my surprise, 50,000 enrolled. Oh, when, when that happened, it was as if I had just emerged with the submarine. And through the periscope, I could see what happened on the surface of the ocean. And I saw it was filled with drowning people desperately wanting to get saved. I kind of woke up. Humanity is salvation willing. They are desperate. They want to get saved. And here I sit with my little wrong ideas. I said, oh Lord, help me to move to the drumbeat of the Holy Spirit. And he began to do that. I have now this big job on hand with those 50,000 students. 
I designed the course myself, of course, with only one thing in object, one object in mind. I wanted to, I wanted them to get saved, because they were not saved. So it worked very well. I had to rent offices. One day I had to pay the rent. It was only fifty dollars per month. But fifty dollars is a lot if you haven't got one in your pocket. And the whole day I felt the pressure. At at five o'clock p.m. I had to pay the rent. Oh Lord! Well, fifty dollars was a lot because there was nobody I knew that could give me fifty dollars anyway in that area. But God answers prayer. Five o'clock came, but the money hadn't come, and I left the office just to walk to the house where we, as a family, lived, my wife and our three children. And as I was walking on the road home, on the public road, lots of people crossing. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Holy Spirit just whoosh, came on me, and I heard a little voice say in my heart, "Do you want me to give you one million dollars?" What a temptation! A million dollars. For moments, it shot through my mind what I couldn't do for Jesus with one million dollars. One million dollars! I said to myself, I could bombard the whole world with the gospel. Today, I know better. All of a sudden, a second thought crossed my mind, and I'm not a weepy person at all. I'm a tough German. <laughs> I stood there on that public road, tears gushing out of my eyes, people passing me left and right. I had forgotten this world. I threw up my arms and I cried. No, Lord, I'm not asking for one million dollars. I'm asking for one million souls. I said, Lord, one million souls less in hell, and one million souls more in heaven. That shall be the purpose of my life and ministry. One million souls. And a moment, the Holy Spirit spoke words to me I had never heard or read before, and these words have become the motto of my life. He said. You will plunder hell and populate heaven for Calvary's sake. <laughs> hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah! Blessed be the name of Jesus. I just grabbed it. I said, "Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord." I left Lesotho. I said, where do I start? I moved from Lesotho to South Africa, Johannesburg, right next to the big airport in Johannesburg. Five car minutes away from the home I had there now. I remember when all the when all our little belongings in the boxes were dropped at the roadside there, and I sat on one. I felt like a speck of dust floating in the universe. I said, Lord, I heard you say Africa shall be saved. I don't know how. I haven't got a clue, but here I am. I'm all by myself. I've got nobody. I have no team. I've got nothing. Here I sit on this box at the roadside. For four weeks, I didn't hear the voice of God, and I felt ill. 
I went to a doctor. He said to me, you've got stomach ulcers. I said, what? And then God spoke to me. In the morning, I woke up without stomach ulcers. And I haven't had them since. And I went to the little town of uh, capital of Gaborone, of, of Botswana, called Gaborones. I went there for another matter. A local pastor expected my coming, and I arrived there. When I arrived there, I, I had to walk from the airport to town because I didn't have the money for the cab. And as I was walking, suddenly the Holy Spirit, he seems to find me on the road. Came upon me and he said, can you see over there? I said, yes, Lord. It says there, National Stadium. And the Lord said to me, I want you to preach my word there. Wow. I said, Lord, I always had wanted to preach in a stadium. But the people never came. But if you say, I'm to preach in the stadium, I will preach in the stadium. I met the local pastor. After greeting, I said, I want you to go with me to the authorities. I want to rent the national stadium. Today, in four weeks, my crusade is starting. The first one. I saw his chin drop. He said to me, what? National Stadium? What do you want the National Stadium for? Don't you know that I've got 40 people in my church? I said, no, I don't know about your 40 people. But I know a few minutes ago, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. I tell you this on purpose. Because I believe this is how God will deal with you as well. He was humble enough to go with me to the authorities. And when I put my signature under the contract for the stadium, I started to perspire. I said, how am I going to fill that stadium? Somehow my mind played tricks on me. I already saw me in the national stadium with, sitting with 40 people. You know how our minds are? Conjuring up pictures. I, I, I quickly added a few days to my visit in Gaborones. I went from church to church. I said, I'm Reinhard Bonnke. In four weeks' time, uh, we have a great crusade here in the National Stadium. Would you please be so kind to cooperate? Everyone said no. But everybody also said, who are you? I said, I'm Mr. Nobody, but God spoke to me. They said, anyone can say that. I said, I agree, but he really spoke to me. And when they all said no, when they all said no, I woke up. I said, Lord, you said I should rent the stadium. This is now our understanding, I said, Lord. I do the preaching and you bring the people. Peace came into my heart. I flew back the same day. Fasting and praying. Putting together a tiny team. And then four weeks later, arriving in Gaborones. Oh, I had prayed so much. I said, Lord, just to comfort my worried heart, let the stadium be filled the first day. Meeting, first meeting came, there were 100 people. I know for sure because I counted 10 times. <laughs> I counted from left to right and then from right to left. But 100 is 100 if you count the heads and not the fingers. I took my Bible, I opened the Bible, I began to preach. I was very disappointed. I preached about 10 minutes and suddenly jumped up over there and shouted, I've just been healed! Another one, another one, four. And I thought by myself, 
that is funny. I didn't even preach on healing. How come they interrupt my sermon? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Psst. <laughs> Praise God. I said, how is it possible? Today, of course, I have the perfect answer. Because I tell you for sure that Jesus often can't wait until we preachers have finished with our boring sermons. He itches to act. Say amen. He needs, he needs little persuasion. Our God is the God of action. And he delights to show his glory. He is a savior who wants to save. He died to save us. Oh, praise God. Then I called the people forward. I went down and laid hands on them. Until then I had never seen such a thing. Everyone I touched collapsed. I was frightened. I had never seen this. I heard, I heard this happen somewhere in America. I had never seen it. As a matter of fact, I didn't know whether the people were just playing or what. I stooped down and I opened some eyelids. And I only saw the white of the eye. Then I knew this was real. But one woman fell down being blind and came up seeing. And one man went down as a cripple and came up leaping. I thought that place exploded. Oh, the next day, within two, three days, for the first time in my life, I preached to a packed stadium. That's how it all began. That's how it began. An absolutely packed stadium. For the first time in my life, I saw thousands of people getting up all at the same time before I made an altar call. First, I didn't know which direction they were going to go. But they came running forward and they were kneeling there weeping and the Holy Spirit, conviction of sin. Then I knew something, something has happened. I was longing for so much. Then the Lord spoke to me. I tell you this because this is the pattern, the foundation God laid for my present day ministry. And the Lord said to me, tomorrow I want you to pray for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, not in a public stadium. No, I came from the German church. We prayed maybe once or twice for the baptism in the Holy Spirit per year, more or less, mostly less. <laughs> and when the Holy Day came, we locked all the windows, we drew all the drapes, we locked all the doors. Nobody was to hear how we would praise the Lord in new tongues. I said, Lord, you want me to preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit in a public stadium? The Lord said, yes, I have a very good reason. I said, Lord, what is it? Please tell me. He said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And there's so much flesh around, I can't fit them into a prayer meeting. Oh, I said, Lord, forgive me. I stood up, I said to the people, tomorrow you're going to see what human eyes have never seen before. I didn't tell them that I hadn't seen it myself either. I said, the Holy Spirit is going to fall in the middle of the stadium and you will all be filled with power from on high. 
Oh! The next day, capacity crowd. I was just about to start when a friend came to me and said, Reinhardt, can't you please change the subject? I said, why? He said, the bishop has come. <laughs> I said, no change of subjects. It's a high time. High time the bishop hears about it. <laughs> and then I started to preach. I said, how many of you want this glorious gift? By mistake, it was forgotten to mention anything about new tongues <laughs> clean forgotten can you believe it <laughs> clean forgotten and I wanted to get up and correct that mistake the Lord said leave it <laughs> there the people stood wanting to have that gift oh I said to them Lift your hands and close your eyes. But I kept my eyes open. I wanted to see. And then, as the praise was swelling up, I saw it. A gigantic wave of transparent, beautiful water moved in from my left side, slowly racing through that stadium. And as I saw the that wave sweep over the crowd. Everyone it touched. All the people in the stadium fell on their backs and were praising the Lord in new tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. I was shocked. I stood there shaking like a little boy, weeping, weeping. I cried, my God, my God, my God, is it possible? Is it possible? And since that day it rings in my spirit. In the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Australia will be filled. Filled. You shall be filled. New Zealand will be filled. Will be filled. Southeast Asia will be filled. China will be filled. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I said, now I know what breaks the devil's back in Africa. It's nothing but a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We can come with our clever sermons, but you know sermonettes are for Christianettes. <laughs> well, if you come in the power of the Holy Spirit, no devil can resist. We are not on the defense. We are on the offense. It's the offense of the cross, but we are condemned to victory. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I know somehow in my heart, I know in my heart, that Jesus is here and that connectors will be connected. Maybe you don't quite know yet what that means. But it shall become clear, absolutely clear. I always was highly interested to know how did Jesus did the calling? How, how does he call? It is actually quite easy because he does call today as he did call in the past. And if you want to see how he did call in the past, you only need to go back to Luke chapter 6. Verse 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas 
the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Now let me draw your attention to one or two important matters. Jesus was on his way to pray early in the morning. It says here, so, sorry, he went there late at night. He prayed all night. All night, scholars say, means 12 hours. Let's say 7 o'clock in the evening to 7 o'clock in the morning. 12 hours. After all, he wanted to choose 12 apostles. He, I'm sure, possibly wanted to dedicate one hour of prayer for each of them. Can you imagine Jesus praying? I always wondered, how did Jesus pray? Wouldn't you be thrilled if you knew Jesus had prayed a whole hour for you? Huh? And I thought by myself, how did Jesus pray? How did he pray? Did it take so long for the Father to give him the names of those people? And then, early in the morning, he came down from the mountain. And now listen. When, if I read the record right, when Jesus chose his apostles at random, or I get the feeling he chose them as he bumped into them. You and you and you. <laughs> and what about you and you? And you and you and you and you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I need three more. Ha ha. One, two, three. Twelve. Please excuse me. I don't want to be disrespectful to Jesus. In half a minute, you will understand why I say what I now say. I thought by myself. I don't need to pray for 12 hours and then go and make such bad choices. Just have a look whom he chose. There was Peter, impetuous Peter. The very Peter who betrayed him. Oh my God! Jesus chose him. They were the sons of Zebedee. When they were in Samaria and the Samaritans refused accommodation, they said to the Lord, Lord, let fire fall from heaven, burn this village to ashes. What wonderful apostles they would make. <laughs> they had the spirit of Elijah. So I could go through the whole list and I could bring out all their faults. Let me just talk about one more. Judas Iscariot. Not just that Judas Iscariot sold him to the Sanhedrin. But the Bible says Judas was a thief, a thief, and Jesus chose him. I want to warn every pastor here, never, never choose a thief as your church treasurer. <laughs> but Jesus did just that. He did just that. And then I said to myself, no! I cannot believe that Jesus prayed for 12 hours on that morning or through that night. Father, show me the Superman in Israel. I want to pick my apostles. 
I'll tell you why Jesus didn't pray like that. Because Israel had no superman. Australia has no superman. America has no superman. Germany for sure has no superman. There may be some in Hollywood, but they are all fakes. All of them. So what did Jesus pray? What did Jesus pray? You know what happened to me? I say this with awe. It was to me as if the Holy Spirit took me and carried me to that mountain where Jesus was praying. And I kind of heard what he prayed. Jesus did not pray, Father, show me the Superman. He prayed something entirely different. This is what he prayed. He said, my father. He always said, my father. You know that I have to choose my twelve apostles. Help me not to plan success as the world plans success. Help me not to choose as kings and rulers choose. Father, not my will, but your will be done. It took 12 hours for Jesus to get the victory over that one point and then he came down from the mountain and he chose ordinary people because he knew the best among us wouldn't be able to build his eternal kingdom unless he would be equipped with power from on high he had the freedom to take anyone choose ordinary people the most ordinary people and turn the most ordinary into the most extraordinary and in the kingdom of god the extraordinary is no is so so plenteous that it becomes ordinary hallelujah I tell you how we would have chosen. We wouldn't have gone to pray on a mountain. We would have gone to the University of Jerusalem. We would have said, give me a list of the top students here. The best communicators, the best orators, those who are movers of man. We have got a gospel that needs to cross the whole world. Jesus didn't come close to the University of Jerusalem. And this gives a chance to all of us. Are you happy? Are you happy? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He even chose me. He even chose me. That's a mystery to me. But I said, Lord, as long as you don't find anyone else, thank you very much. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the greatest honor. It's the greatest honor in this world. It's the highest form of life on earth. I always feel that my mortal hands can build God's eternal kingdom. That my mortal lips can preach the eternal gospel is the privilege of all privileges. Oh, hallelujah. When we were fleeing, uh, during World War II, my family was fleeing from East Germany to the West. And we arrived in Denmark. We Germans were all put into 
refugee camps and from my fifth year to my ninth year all I knew was barbed wire there was no proper school there were no qualified teachers and when at age nine we were repatriated to Germany after finding our father through the Red Cross I was, they put me into the school of my age group I had to catch up three years that's why I struggled at school not because I was dumb but I had that disadvantage I struggled I struggled and I struggled until I caught up and it was very easy but I felt I felt so inferior my scores were so poor and I prayed and I struggled in Germany when somebody is no good we have a special name for them we call them zeros if somebody fails his exams if somebody can't keep a job if somebody drops everything we just call them ah ah that one he's just a zero she's just a zero zero in German is null we call them nullies that is just a zero well I tell you one thing I was a zero when God called me at age 10 but I responded I was so moved I was shaking and crying I responded and Jesus said Reinhard come I want you to preach the gospel in Africa you know what happened I was a zero and when I responded to the call of Jesus I discovered that he was the number one and when I the zero stood next to him we together were already ten is there any other zero let me see your hand all right 100 all right 1000 all right 10,000 100,000 1 million 10 million 100 million 1 billion I don't mind as a matter of fact I don't mind to be the last zero because the last one is the most valuable say amen. amen this is the lesson Jesus puts value into everyone who follows him eternal value into everyone who follows him the other side of the story is take the one away and the zeros become all zeros again oh I have made up my mind I seek the honor of God and not the honor of man I'm not interested in applause I'm not interested in titles I'm not interested if people give me great names I don't even notice it years back I was approached by a university they said we would like to give you an honorary doctorate I said I need to pray over it when I finished praying they called me said will you accept the honorary doctorate I said to them I don't need a doctor because I'm not sick <laughs> no I've got nothing against education as a matter of fact I got a little bit of it myself but what I'm saying is this all the wisdom of man will not save one soul Jesus had to die on the cross the Holy Spirit had to come he raised Christ from the dead and he sends us out and empowers us to preach the gospel let's seek the honor of God Sometimes people ask me how I have survived so many years in this kind of ministry. 
I tell you how I have survived. Because I'm immune to the praise of man, I am also immune to the criticism of man. If you love the praise of man, the criticism of man will destroy you. But I'm on nobody's payroll. Here am I as a servant of God. I want to plunder hell and I want to populate heaven. Hell empty, heaven full. In Jesus' name, say amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want to die one day with a microphone in my hand. And although I believe connectors are going to be connected here today by the Holy Spirit, don't you get the idea that I'm going to die tonight? You know how, what I, how I imagine it? I imagine standing with my microphone in, a, in front of a million people in Africa. And while I preach, suddenly I see uh, the sweet chariot. Oh. Coming lower and coming closer, closer, closer. And when it passes by my platform, I'm not going to drop my mic. I'm going to throw it. Who wants to catch it? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. I once prayed with an old man, I think he was over 90, and he was about to die. And suddenly a thought, a strange thought, touched my heart. I thought by myself, what would I pray for if I was now him, ready to go? I didn't need to think long. I said, I know what I would pray. I would pray. Lord, give me one more crusade. I want to hit the bull's eye one more time. Oh, hallelujah! I feel the finger of God is here this morning. And he's touching. You may be already a preacher with all his certificates and with everything he has and wants. That may be very, very well true. But God has got something more for you. He's looking for men who just throw themselves upon the Lord. Men and women! In Jesus' name! I cast myself upon the Lord for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, life or death, it all didn't matter. But I said, Lord, here am I. Send me. Let me tell you one more story. I think I've got time still for, to tell you one thing. Have I got time? This is my petrol. I had a crusade in in, in the Congo, Lubumbashi. The stadium was packed. In those days, we still had the crusades in the stadium. Today, we have the fire conference in the stadium. In the afternoons, I don't allow anybody to interrupt me. I pray, I prepare, I focus. For the evening I was on my knees at my bedside I just opened the Bible I wanted to read where I had left off when the Holy Spirit said to me read 
where you normally don't read. I immediately knew what he meant. First Chronicles. <laughs> the first nine chapter I always skipped. Why? Because of the genealogies. Starting with Adam. Adam begat. And then the whole verses. Begat, 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 begat. I could never get any blessing out of begetting. I thought, what blessing can I get out of this? But now the Holy Spirit said to me, I should read it. So I started to read. After one chapter, I stopped. I said, this reads like a telephone directory. I forced myself to read the next chapter. All these unpronounceable names. What blessing can I get out of them? Suddenly, whoo, the Holy Spirit was in my hotel room. And I could see the finger of God on my very Bible. On my very Bible. The finger of God was following those verses. You know, the finger of God is another name for the Holy Spirit. And I saw his finger move along the verses. And every time a name appeared, the finger of God made a brief pause. So he actually, because there were so many names, he went in staccato. All of a sudden I realized these names seem to be a bother to me, but they are highly interested, interesting to the author of that book. Every name is extremely important to God. Your name. And I thought by myself, why is the finger of God moving in staccato? And then I realized the Lord was looking for people who were willing to dedicate themselves to the building of his eternal kingdom. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I was awed by the presence of God. What an experience. And you know what I feel right now? The finger of God is here. Not moving over pages, but moving through the rows. Maybe starting right there on top. I may not have seen you even, but I tell you, you are on God's list to be touched this very moment by the finger of God he's looking for people who are willing to throw themselves into his arms who don't calculate always according to business principles how much do I make what about fame and greatness I vow to God, I don't want to be a peacock evangelist. I want to be someone who really goes to the very abyss of hell, to the brink of the volcano, to rescue those who are about to fall in. In Jesus' name. This is not a matter of career. This is a matter of service. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you a crown of life.
This is the call here. Jesus is willing to call any zero. And the moment you respond, he sets himself in front of you and you will change. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And the finger of God is here. If you say yes, well for you. If you say no, you may leave here. But one thing will never leave you. The fingerprint of the finger of God is forever impressed on your soul and on your spirit. You will never get rid of him, I promise you. Amen. We have every right to be humble because we only have got one master and his name is Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. I pray that Sydney may not just get revival. I pray that Sydney and Australia may become export centers of revival to the rest of the world. shall I send who will go for us and he cried here are my Lord send me and if you one of them jump to your feet right now just jump to your feet I wished I could lay my hand on you I can't because the, the arrangements here don't allow it but I'll tell you one thing the finger of God has already marked you and touched you and God means business with you if you are serious with him. Some of you have been already called ten times. And you don't need to, to, to stand up again. You should rather go and buy a suitcase. And a ticket. And go. And Jesus will go with you. This is what I'm telling you as an evangelist who comes from the very front line. Some people are so obsessed with getting the approval of man. You need the approval of God. And that flame on your head is your legitimation. And is your authority. And your ordination. In Jesus name. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Close your eyes. Lift your hands. Let's worship Jesus. Dedicate yourself. Come on. Lord I pray that you may now lay your hand on every head in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that all excuses of the past may and shall melt away and shall never be found ever again. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that connectors will now be connected with those who went before us. We will take their torch, their burning torch. We will take that burning baton and carry it to the finish line. Australia shall be saved. China shall be saved. Indonesia shall be saved. Oh my God! Papua New Guinea shall be saved. Southeast Asia shall be saved. India, India, India shall be saved. And Lord, I pray, mark everyone that lifts their hands to you. Mark them. Mark them with that flame from above in the name of Jesus. And I pray that they may never ever forget what has happened today in Jesus name come on let's worship him worship him oh hallelujah oh hallelujah oh hallelujah Oh hallelujah. Kurra papa kashia sari anto robo pokoshia. Ilala masarra pokoshika lalabasia. 
When you go through fire, saith the Lord, it shall not burn you. When you go through water, it shall not drown you. I am with you, says the Lord, and I will increase you, and I will strengthen you, and I will give a nation to you, says the Lord. I will give a nation to you. I have already given a nation to you, says the Lord. Therefore, go. I am with you. And you, your spirit, your soul, and your body shall from this moment on become a riverbed for the life-giving flood of my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Lord, we lift up holy hands for the salvation of Australia. Australia shall be saved. Come on, agree with me. Australia shall be saved. New Zealand shall be saved. Oh, Fiji shall be saved. The Solomon Islands shall be saved. Irian Jaya shall be saved. Papua New Guinea shall be saved. Indonesia shall be saved. Singapore, China shall be saved. Malaysia shall be saved. And India shall be saved. Lord, I thank you that your fire will race across this globe in Jesus' name. And we will follow the fire in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm looking forward to tonight. I really am look, I'm looking forward to tonight. I believe God is going to do something fantastic. Are you blessed? Yes. Amen. You know, I got all my stuff here and forgot to mention it. That it's just like me. I just want to mention this, if I may. I've written a book called Even Greater. If you start reading it, I guarantee you will not drop it before you finish it. These are 12 real life stories that inspire you to do greater things for God. It's a fantastic, I, I wished I had time to share with you a little bit, but it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It will knock you off your sofa. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Even greater. This is my... This is my special wish for you and me. God says, I've got something even greater, even greater for you. Say amen. Thank you, Brian. Amen. Amen.